All right, let's have a look at the five questions that we have for our first class. I, I, I do these kind of, I call these work throughs and I, I do them in front of a whiteboard. I'm not sure if we will need it today, but let's just quickly go over these answers. So, question one, I have collected the following data on marital status. Married is zero, unmarried is one, and then I have zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, one. Those are all the observations. And the question is, what measurement level is this? Well, to answer a question like this, ask yourself what these numbers represent. And uh, the first question, you can then answer is, can I do anything with these numbers mathematically? Does it make sense to say one plus one plus zero is two, and then maybe divided by three? No, it does not, because then, then what am I doing? And I'm saying, okay, I have, how do I call this? I have a married person, an unmarried person, an unmarried person, so together this would be two, and then I divide that two by three, because that's the, uh, uh, total number of observations of two-third married this makes no sense so if I can't do math then typically I'm dealing with either a nominal scale or an ordinal scale well for this to be an ordinal scale I have to be able to say something along the lines of well one one value is more advanced than another value this is the case if you think about children in grades uh, you might have one kid in grade one you may have another child in grade two, and you can certainly say that uh, the child in grade two is more advanced than the child in grade one, right? However, you can still not say, okay, well, uh, one plus two, that equals three, um, and I, I divide three by two. Uh, now, I, I have... On average, a child in grade one and a half, this is not possible, right? This, that makes no sense. So, although this data is ordinal, I can order it. I can say two is more advanced than one. I can still not really do any math on it. And, and that's pretty much it. Now, in this case, I just had married and unmarried as zeros and ones. That sounds to me like, an order, no, sorry, like a nominal scale. After all, I can't say married is better than unmarried. Although they do say marriage is so much more than a word. It's a sentence. Now, having said that, <clears throat> in this case, I would answer nominal scale. It's certainly not interval. It's certainly not ratio. And we'll get to those two later, I have the feeling. Question two. I live seven kilometers away from RDP. What measurement level is distance? Well, distance is interesting. I can certainly say that 20 kilometers plus 10 kilometers is 30 kilometers. I can also say that 20 kilometers is more than five kilometers. So here, I don't just have something nominal. I don't just have something ordinal. I probably have something more than that. So what, I, what remains to me is interval and ratio scales. Okay, well, a ratio scale actually has an absolute zero, which means that zero measured on that scale means Whatever you have measured does not exist. This is different with, say, an interval scale where zero is kind of arbitrary. For example, zero degrees Celsius, well, that is a temperature. But zero degree, sorry, zero kilometers distance, that's not a distance. That means there is nothing. There is, you're, you're, you're right there, right? So in this case, I would say, when it comes to distance, that is an, a ratio scale. It has an absolute zero because zero means no distance and therefore ratio. If it would have an arbitrary zero point, like temperature in degrees Celsius, then it would be interval. Okay. The third question is one that I find students often struggle with. What does equal unit size mean in the context of measurement properties? Well, equal unit size is an important concept when you talk about measurement scales. Uh, let's let's say that I, I again I'm, I'm talking about children and I have a child in grade one one in grade two and one in grade three okay then I have these values one two and three these are the three grades now equal unit size means that every time I go up one value on that scale from one to two from two to three the underlying distance remains the same it is true that there is not more of a difference between these two than between those two. 
Now, if you find that a little bit difficult, I, I, I can certainly understand that, it might be clearer to you to think about something else, like, say, distance. Let's say that I have, I'm measuring something in centimeters, and I have, I guess I could have just left this, but that's okay, two and three. The step from one to the next measurement on the scale is one centimeter. And the step from two to three on this scale is again one centimeter. And that is what we mean by equal unit size. Now, you may say, okay, but, but yeah, of course, but does this matter? Yes, it does matter. It matters when you deal with nominal or ordinal scales. And I think the clearest way to think about this is to deal with an ordinal scale. So let's say, we don't have to use that grade example again, let's say that I'm ranking people. You will see later in the course we like to rank things in statistics. Let's say that I've measured four weights of people. The first person I measured weighed 100 pounds, the second one 120, the third one 140, and the final one 250 pounds. Okay, I can rank these numbers. That means I give the lowest value, the rank one, the next one, rank two, the third, rank three, and the final one, rank four. Of course, they have to be sorted, right? You go from, in this case, low to high. Now, let's, let's think about equal unit size again. You'll agree with me that the difference between one and two is one unit. Between two and three is one unit. And between three and four is one unit. However, those are just ranks. The underlying numbers, they have a different distribution. Look what that means. The difference between 100 and the next uh, observation that I've measured is 20 pounds. Okay. The difference between the second and the third measurement is 20 pounds. Now, I hope you see where this is going. Is the difference between the third and fourth measurements 20 pounds again? No, it is not. It's 110 pounds. And this is a problem because these numbers all go up by a single unit every time, but the underlying numbers actually do not. So these ranks have equal unit size, but the actual observations, in this case, do not really have equal unit size. And that can be a problem. Now, this would not be a problem if I had measured 100 pounds, 101, 102, 103, 104, all the way down to 250, because then there would be equal unit size. After all, with every measurement, uh, an observation goes up one unit. But here, that is not the case. I hope that makes sense to you. If not, you have to ask me. Okay. Next question. The mean reaction time in my experimental group is 400 milliseconds, millisecond, one one thousandth of a second, and the mean in my control group is 550 milliseconds. Create an appropriate graph to display these two values. A line graph does not really make sense here, because these are two completely separate groups. It's kind of inappropriate to, to connect the two with a line, because that would suggest there'd be measurements between the two groups, but I only have two groups. So now what do I do? I would create something like this. I have group one, I have group two. Oops, um, I dropped my, uh, the cap to my marker. And then I have uh, some, let's do something like this. 600, 550, 500, 450, 400, uh, 350, and I'm gonna put that symbol in there to let people know that I've skipped a little bit there, okay? Because this should, of course, say 300, 250, 200, all the way to zero. Okay, now, what do I do? Uh, experimental group was 400 milliseconds. I think a bar chart would be appropriate here. And the control group, 550. Now, I put this in on purpose to hopefully illustrate a point. If you are going to write up a manuscript at some point, for publication or something, this is meaningless to the reader. So it would be much better 
to actually label that and say experimental group, just to save time, I'm not going to write down the whole thing, although now I've wasted time explaining that, uh, and control group. And then I give this axis a label, group. This axis also gets a label, reaction time, and a unit, milliseconds. Sorry, it's not easy to write sideways. There you go. Bar chart is very useful here. Now the final question is in question four, did you use a bar chart or a histogram? Why? Well, what is it? I already said bar chart, but how can you tell? The bars are not connected, right? So in other words, this is a bar chart. If there'll be no space between them, it would be a histogram. But histogram is kind of inappropriate here because a histogram measures the frequency of something. How often did something happen? Frequency goes here then. And then here go the observations. So that could be useful if I wanted to do something like this. rid of the whole thing. If I wanted to show what my reaction times in the whole experiment look like, I could do something like this. I'm not going to draw this very prettily. And then maybe there was nothing there, but there is one there. Then I would have reaction time here, and I would have got better over, with that over the years. Frequency goes on the y-axis, and whatever I've measured goes on the x-axis. And now I can show, okay, I had this many of these reaction times, and uh, let's say this is 450, I had this many of those reaction times, etc. And you can see that the bars now touch, except for here, because I did not have that observation. Whatever that is, maybe this was 800, and this is 850 or something. Done. That's it. Hope this was clear. If not, let me know.